Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to the first of two uh, plant physiology webinars in July. Both are on the topic of fruit crops. So today we have three authors whose work appears in this focus issue. Our host is uh, Richard Espley, who's one of the editors of the focus issue, and our moderator is the Cheng Kao, who's an assistant features editor at Plant Physiology. Um, the focus issue is currently online, and it is, um, the editors are listed here. It's, as Richard will say, it's the biggest focus issue we've run so far. So it's a pretty exciting topic. Um, we will be posting this to YouTube where you will find all of the plant physiology and plant cell webinar recordings, as well as the Plante webinars. Um, we'd like to thank the ASPB members whose membership do support this series. And if you're interested in becoming a member, you can use the code PRESENTS10 to get 10% off your dues. Um, it's a great society that supports all aspects of plant science. If you have questions, feel free to email me and williams at ASPB.org. Um, feel free to join, come in again if you're having technical problems. And I'm going to now turn this over to Richard to tell us a bit more about the focus issue and the topic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's it's a it's a real honor to do this one. Um, I'm just going to share a few slides with you. Um, to kick us off, and hopefully you can see those. I'm getting a thumbs up from Mary, so that's great. So celebrating the July 2023 focus issue on fruit crops, this web webinar tonight, and then, or tonight for me, but this morning or this afternoon for you. Uh, and there's another one on Thursday, the 27th of July. So um, it's, uh, it's been great to be a part of actually, because um, as Mary said, this has been the most successful focus issue so far. And we feature 25 original research papers, and you'll hear three really good uh, 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 topics today. We've got eight updates, uh, really good reviews, uh, two news and views, and a topical review. So, uh, and I was just interested thinking about, you know, the success of this and why. And I guess I looked back 20 years ago to plant physiology and I went through the, the, the issues and I found one paper on apple and a couple of papers on other fruit, uh, a melon paper and a, and a mulberry. But apart from that, of course, it was mostly in those days, Arabidopsis and other model crops, some tomato. But then I looked 20 years later, 2022, and there were 13 papers just, just on apple itself. And in fact, this year, partly because of the focus issue, we've got already 13 papers on apple. That's not to be exclusive about other fruit, but I think it shows you how good research is now. And I'm not going to talk about a given introduction to fruit, of course, but uh, I mean, obviously, they are very important for our diet and they're a very important driver of economic growth. And we do have increasing demand for high quality. So it's got to taste good. It's got to look right. And it's got to have no fatal flaws, really of fruit that is sustainably produced. And I think that sustainable thing is a really important thing for the future. But the industry, fruit industry is facing some pretty severe challenges right now with the unpredictability of climate change in some areas of fruit production, very uh, 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 difficult water shortages, and of course, labor costs and labor av availability. But those challenges in a way, create opportunities for us as scientists Against that, of course, some of these fruit crops can be difficult to study. And, and certainly if you work in fruit trees, for example, you've got a very long juvenility period. Some of those fruit crops are, are quite recalcitrant, it's difficult to transform. And until fairly recently, we've not really had the genetic resources, but I guess that's been offset now by the, the changes in sequencing and the proliferation of, of fruit uh, crop genomes that we've now got. And there are some really interesting and uh, uh, useful potential new transformation techniques that can help us uh, to transform some of these difficult uh, crops. And I think all of these things right now are super important because, you know, as the way I see it, we've got to be able to do faster breeding and using new breeding technologies and gene editing, we're going to need all this genetic information and to do all these mechanistic studies to know which genes to edit. 
So, uh, Mary and I, we both put up this front cover of plant physiology and of the focus issue, and um, it features uh, some, some apples grown in Hawke's Bay in New Zealand, where I am, and, um, and, and they look very nice. And that was last year. And then this year we had a cyclone come through and devastated some of those orchards and, and a lot of the commercial growing regions in, in New Zealand. And uh, these are slightly gloomy pictures, I'm very sorry, but I think it highlights what we're up against in terms of uh, climate change and how important science is going to be in the future to try and uh, uh, address these problems. So just on the focus issue then, uh, I would, we've got some great talks tonight, but I would, today, sorry, but I would also just um, emphasize there's some really good reviews in here, some updates, there's eight of these on various topics, ripening, softening, metabolism, signaling, etc. I just put three here uh, uh, on to give you some idea of, of what they uh, represent. So fruit softening, combating drought, and uh, some, some reviews on amplifying and, and the, and the colours. There's also a very nice topical review on the tra post-transcriptional regulation of, of fruit ripening. So um, I think there's some really good reviews in there. But today we're talking about the original research articles. And as I said, there's 25 of those in, 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 this, in this issue. And they cover a range of topics, abiotic and biotic stresses, and the role phytohormones play in fruit development and pigments and their control, ripening growth sugars, chilling requirements. That's going to be, I think, really important for the future in terms of flowering and, and, uh, and, and climate change. And there are papers on transcriptional control and epigenetics and mRNA uh, of various uh, uh, processes. And, and really nicely, and nothing to do with the editors making decisions on it, but, but the, the focus issue has a range of different fruit species in there. And I think we, can, we might be working in a particular fruit crop, but we can all learn from each other. I just put up some images on the right-hand side of some of the uh, papers that I've enjoyed reading. So today is about uh, these researchers, Christina, Jing, and Erica, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing what they're going to say, and I thank them very much for coming. But just before I, I sign off, uh, I just wanted to thank my um, fellow editors, Lai Liang Cheng from Cornell University, Feng Wang Ma from Northwest ANF, Michael Malnoy from Fundazione Edmund Mack in Italy, and uh, we were led by uh, Jun Wu from Nanjing Agricultural University. Thanks to Mary for putting this together and the team at Plant Fizz, and of course all the reviewers, um, uh, but particularly thanks to Christina Ting and Erica. And I'll hand over now to Du Cheng to do the proper work of this. Thank you very much. Now, can I? Hello, I am De Chang Tao. Thank you, Richard, for your introduction. Uh, today, I am the moderator of this webinar. Uh, today, we have three speakers, Christina, Jing, and Erica. And for each speaker, we have 13 minutes for presentation and three minutes for questions and discussion. Uh, the first speaker is Christina Godwer. Uh, Christina is a PhD student at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece. Her research is mainly focused on plant physiology of fruit trees in the context of climate change. Recently, she made some very good progress on the acclimation of olive trees to a biotic stress using integrated multi-omics and functional approaches. For these achievements, she was recently awarded a scholarship from the Hellenic Foundation of Research and Innovation. And uh, let's see what the new story she brings to us. Welcome, Christina. Well, hello from me. Good morning from Greece. Um, I hope that everything is okay with my with my slide. Can you please uh, 
say that everything is okay to me, that you see everything correctly. Yes, it looks perfect. Thank you very much. So good morning from me. Thank you for the introduction, the chunk. I'm really glad to participate in this focus issue webinar. And today I'm gonna to present you a part of my PhD thesis concerning the molecular basis of salinity priming in olive trees, a paper that was recently published in Plant Physiology. Salinity stress strongly impacts plant growth and poses a growing threat to sustainable agriculture Notably in the context of climate crisis, the Mediterranean basin is a climate and biodiversity hotspot and climate change threatens agroecosystems, which include olive trees, which are, that are of high ecological and socioeconomic importance. But why study olives? The problem with the olive tree is that despite its socioeconomic importance, it's considered a difficult experimental material. First of all, because it's a non-model species, but also due to the fact that since it's a perennial tree, it has evolved complex mechanisms in order to acclimate to a series of abiotic stresses. However, attempts are trying, are starting, sorry, to be made through studies that try to create a blueprint of all its response into several uh, abiotic stresses in order to uncover potential biomarkers for screening in future olive breeding uh, studies. Soil stress in, uh, induce systemic acclimation, which plays a major role in plant survival during salinity. Olive is considered a moderately tolerant plant to salinity, activating acclimation mechanisms even in moderate salinity concentration. Its salt acclimation mechanisms are mainly attributed to osmotic adjustment and uh, particularly by accumulation of um, sugars and mannitol, or by preventing salt translocation or by decreasing its tra transport, excluding uh, harmful ions like sodium and chloride ions from leaves, or by compartmentalizing toxic ions within the leaves. Several studies exist on the effects of salinity on olive tree physiology. However, the molecular response uh, of olive tissues to salinity stress and acclimation remain uncharacterized. To achieve such salt priming responses, plants evolve multiple tissue-specific metabolic pathways that allow them to communicate different stress signals from a particular part of the plant that initially sends the stress, such as the local root tissues, to the entire plant, such as the leaves, in order to have systemic acclimation. Significant progress in understanding plant salinity responses has been achieved through high throughput sequencing technologies, such as DNA or RNA sequencing and mass spectrometry based proteomics. Recently, the concept of proteogenomics has emerged rapidly as an approach to increase, uh, to integrate, uh, excuse me, proteomic with transcriptomic or genomic data. Proteogenomics is experiencing increased importance as an important platform in plant research. Various tools have been developed to correlate such data sets. Also, causal modeling has been used to identify um, uh, sample specific network and, uh, alteration, and thus causal effects explain the proteogenomic data in a, most, in a more uh, precise and accurate way. Causal discovery goes beyond traditional statistical association assessment by justifying the causal nature of an association between two variables based on its persistence as well as the existence of direction in the causal relation between variables determining the cause and effect of each relation. So it's an appropriate method for in the interpretation of biological data. To incorporate the proteogenomics concept into abiotic stress and priming research in plants, we undertook a large scale comprehensive analysis of transcriptomics and proteomics together with metabolomics in both roots and leaves of olive plants that were either pre-treated with low salt and then exposed to high salinity, or that were directly exposed to high salinity. This current work provides insights into the salt priming responses and hopes to give a blueprint for proteogenomic dynamics and causal discovery in all plants. First of all, we had 36 uh, self-fruited one-year-old olive uh, plants. Uh, with, uh, from, a night, from a local Greek cultivar, Chondrolia Halkidikis, from North Greece. 
uh, that were grown in pots under greenhouse con conditions. Salinity priming was performed by irrigating the roots of 12 plants with half-strength Hoagland solution containing 75 uh, millimeter sodium chloride for 45 days, while the other two groups received only Hoagland solution for this period. After the moderate salinity treatment, two groups of plants, among them the ones that experienced priming, were exposed to nutrient solution containing 150 millimeter sodium chloride concentration for another 45 days. The experimental plants were subjected to one of the following three treatments. We had the control where we kept the plants into the Hochland solution for the entire experimental period for the whole 90 days. Then, then they were non-salt stressed. The non-primed plants that were treated with Hochland solution for 45 days and then exposed um, uh, to 150 millimeter uh, sodium chloride for, for 45 days. And the non-primed ones that uh, that were um, the primed ones that were in the Hochland solution containing 75 millimeter uh, sodium chloride for 45 days, and then they were exposed to 100 millimeter so sodium chloride for 45 days again. High salinity induced physiological disturbances in terms of photosynthetic rate, uh, stomatal conductance, and chlorophyll index. Whereas all these parameters were alleviated with the pretreatment of 75 millimeter sodium chloride before high stress imposition. Primed plants maintained a much lower sodium uh, content in leaves than the non primed ones, which is maybe uh, attributed to the root exclusion, ion exclusion uh, mechanism. Non primed plants showed the reduced lift width and um, sponge in parenchyma intercellular spaces in order to salinity, in response to salinity, with a concurrent uh, increase in trichome number in the abaxial leaf surface. Crystal accumulation in vacuums and um, electron dense material, which is probably a phenolic compounds, accumulation of phenolic compounds, uh, was uh, observed around the, pl the plastics as a perforation material and uh, were also found in non-primed leaves. Primed leaves exhibited a less affected plastic phenotype in spite of the presence of phenolic compounds in their vacuoles. Non-primed roots, on the other hand, displayed a stress-induced root development reduction while the root cortex had increased intracellular spaces. To identify genes that were differentially expressed among untreated, controlled, primed and non-primed roots and leaves, RNA-seq analysis was conducted. Venn diagram analysis revealed genes that were commonly and exclusively modulated by the different treatments in each, in each tissue. All significantly, um, uh, all significant differentially expressed genes of leaves and roots for each comparison were mapped to the cake database. Both direct high salinity and priming led to the alterations in genes mostly associated with plant pathogen interactions followed by hormone signal transaction and MAPK signaling. Genes responsible for carbohydrate, fatty acid, and phenylpropanoid metabolism were also differentially regulated in primed and non-primed leaves. As the photosynthetic rate was predominantly um, depressed by salt stress, we found out that most genes modulated by high salinity at prime and non-prime leaves are related with photosynthesis. The majority of differential expressed genes in both primed and non-primed roots were linked to plant hormone signaling. Genes in the roots involved in phenylpropanoid and stark metabolites were also induced in non-primed roots, whereas genes related to plant pathogen interactions were stimulated in prime roots compared to in control. Tunic trypsin inhibitor 2 uh, was the gene that showed the most strongly induced in expression by salt treatments in both tissues, and um, it can serve as a salinity responsive gene in either kind or non kind um, conditions. Quantitative proteomic analysis was also conducted for the same samples as used for plant cryptomic analysis. The impact of salinity treatments in olive roots was stronger than that in the leaves, as evidenced by the number of salt affected proteins. Different salinity treatment groups shared uh, several xenodology trends in leaves including signaling and kinase phosphatase uh, pathways. However, development and transport-related transport proteins were highly increased in non-prime leaves. Some genogeology terms, such as metabolic processes and ATP uh, binding, 
processes were enriched in non-primed and primed roots. However, differences in geontology terms regarding oxidation reduction and kinase phosphatase activities were observed between these types of salt-exposed roots. Several proteins involved in regulation, uh, protein binding, ATP binding, as well as signaling transcription and protein ion binding in leaves and roots, respectively, showed an up accumulation in um, in, an up accumulation in um, trend in prime tissues compared to non-prime tissues. The abundances of the top 10 upregulated proteins in each comparison examined in leaves and roots are also shown. Salinity treatment affected consensus IDs in both prime and non-prime leaves, like the early light induced protein 1. Distinct proteins such as the chloroplastic, amyloplastic, star synthase, and so on, and other, and other proteins were strongly upregulated in leaves and roots, respectively, due to priming only and not non-priming tissues. As an additional step to our current proteomic study, we identified post-translational or chemical modifications in peptides that may have been triggered by salinity and or priming using the MS Fragger software. software. Phosphorylated peptides increased while glucosylation decreased in primed leaves. Regarding non-primed roots, salt-stimulated proline addition and oxidation hydroxylation in peptides was present but suppressed uh, but it was also evident the, pro the suppressed proline oxidation. Carboxylation and S-nitrogylation of peptides were also increased in prime roots, and we also screened some identified proteins in prime and non-prime tissues for such structural alterations and labeled some of them for peptide modification ratio calculation. One of them is the abscisic stress ripening protein 2, which displayed a higher uh, ratio compared to the others, including phosphorylated peptides, um, and highlighting the importance of phosphorylation in priming procedures. To identify the metabolic shifts constituting both salts and uh, priming responses, primary metabolite analysis was also performed. Roots of both salinity treatments exhibited a general trend of lower concentration of metabolic compounds. As substantial alteration of starch and sugar metabolism was observed in salinized plants, we focused on this pathway, including uh, transcriptomics and proteomic data, in order to interpret better the um, alterations that happened during the sugar accumulation pathway. Sucrose accumulated in primed leaves as an osmotic, um, and serving for osmotic homeostasis, while sucrose synthase abundance was increased in primed roots despite the decreased sucrose level. Prime leaves showed increased concentrations in sugars compared to non-primed in general. To interpret the molecular data in a salt priming context, we focused also on significant transcriptomic and proteomic seeds between primed and non-primed plants. Protein buildup is a general priming response to salinity since an extensive accumulation of several proteins that are related to ion binding, stress responses, and signal transduction was detected in primed leaves. Several transcription factors also were detected, along with ion transport related genes that were downregulated in primed roots. Several pathways, principally hormone signaling and defense related interactions, were also affected by priming, differing from salinity related pathways. Particularly, priming led to an induction in opsin and salicylic acid signaling through protein and gene regulator, regulation in roots, while several genes involved in ethylene response, such as those encoding ethylene receptors and ethylene response and transcription factors, were suppressed in primed leaves, avoiding senescence, of course. Besides priming induced universal changes in expression of genes encoding calcium mediated calmodulins and WRKY transcription factor in both primed tissues, whereas distinct tissue specific alteration in expression of hypersensitive response related genes, such as RPM and RPS, were also detected. The molecular changes individually detected by transcriptomic and proteomic analysis in each olive tissue were built into a proteogenomic approach. Findings indicating that the overall and tissue specific transcript and protein abundances exhibited symmetric distribution. Pearson analyses were also performed on a proteomic and transcriptomic data, showing a positive correlation value for all pairwise comparisons. Both transcriptomes and proteomes of salt irrigated plants, primed and non primed, were highly correlated within the tissue. Primed 
uh, roots showed strong connection between transcript and protein levels, and their proteogenomic profile was closely related to non-primed roots. Both transcript to transcript and protein to protein relationship primed and non-primed issues showed high correlation values. However, the transcriptome of salt treated roots and leaves were not highly correlated to those of the control tissues in contrast, in contrast to their proteomes. It is not worthy that the proteome of primed and non-primed leaves exhibited the highest Pearson correlation values among the all tested comparisons. The proteogenomic data were further investigated by assessing the 10 most significant tissue-dependent differences in gene expression and protein abundance among all comparisons. Principally, common transcriptomic changes include a drastic decrease in non-specific lipid transfer protein expression in both primed and non-primed roots. Current work revealed also the, the current work revealed also the priming the priming induced transcriptional activation of genes that encode uh, peptid uh, peptidyl prolyl cis trans isomerases and desiccation related proteins in roots, which has been which was previously found to be induced by salinity stress. It is also noticeable that 8-hydroxygeranial hydrogenase was induced in prime leaves, and it is known that it participates in all Europa in biosynthesis. And um, uh, we have also shown in the previous work that it is uh, that olipropane is really important for olives to overcome um, ROSH uh, accumulation and uh, oxidative uh, stress. Finally, this work characterizes also several priming related proteins, such novel ones, such as the fluid protein PQE502 uh, and Hevamin A, that were not observed in other previous salinity studies. Finally, we also employed the dynamics of causal models at the proteogenomic level to characterize the transcript and protein abundance changes. For the construction of causal relation um, uh, graphs, we combined the data set of significantly altered transcripts and proteins in prime and non-prime tissues that was used. Causal relations between transcripts and proteins within comparisons of interest were detected. A detailed interconsensus network of causally associated genes and proteins revealed that salicylic acid binding protein, SABP, serves as a key participant in leaf priming. Both salicylic acid binding protein 2 and a non classical abirogalactan were associated with a stress response AB barrel domain containing like protein. SRABB in primed olive leaves. Therefore, we propose that this interaction network may regulate olive leaf development in response to salt priming, since salicylic acid binding protein 2 and non classical arabilocalactan are salt responsive proteins that trigger structural changes. Um, also, uh, on the other hand, hormones on the root can also influence chromatin compaction, serving as a signaling molecule to regulate gene expression. In the roots, we can see uh, MAT, which, which is uh, the adenosylmethionine synthase, and SHMT, which is the serine hydroxylmethyltransferase, both genes that are involved in methionine metabolism. And as methionine could be used as a methyl donor, its metabolism is tightly linked to the activated methylation cycle so in roots, we can see priming as a source of um, activating methylation, DNA methylation or epigenetic changes. To sum up everything that we show in this study, we propose, we made the proposed model of olive trees priming mechanism. And based on our through high throughput interaction data, this discovery could allow us to propose a potential salt priming mechanism in a non-model fruit such as the olive. Leaves are not directly affected by the harmful ions, sodium and chloride, since they are selectively translocated by roots. Sugar accumulation in leaves promotes uh, photosynthetic adaptation and osmotic homeostasis. Priming could preserve um, osmotic equilibrium in salt treated olive leaves, as evidenced by the function of putative phosphatoglycerol and phosphatoinositol transfer protein, PGPI protein, supporting the role of these proteins in the osmotic recovery of salt stress plants. During priming, and senescence is avoided by ethylene signaling the activation, whereas protein post-translational modifications could serve as a regulatory priming signaling system in the leaves with modifications such as phosphorylation, 
um, and others playing a significant role in signaling. The increase of metabolites of the TCA cycle, as well as the epigenetic regulation of mitochondrial proteins, serve also as a means of energy production um, during acclimation and energy preservation. And the oxidant activity of genes involved in olivropa and biosynthesis is also promoted during acclimation. And finally, through this model, we can also propose that this interaction network may regulate all leaf development in response to salt priming through leaf structural changes favoring survival despite the high salt uh, conditions. On the roots, on the other hand, roots have halted growth through suppressing their cell proliferation and growth due to their focus on activating the ion exclusion mechanisms as they serve as they serve as the first receptor organ of the stress they can undergo a lot of alterations on a molecular level related to epigenetic modifications or energy production under hypoxic conditions post transcriptional modifications are also present in prime roots However, they seem to serve mechanisms dealing with protein degradation due to the damage provoked by harmful sodium and chloride ions. Finally, transcription factors decrease their expression in prime roots, underlying transcriptional arrest of the tissue during salt irrigation conditions. Our findings, we hope that not only will promote proteogenomic driven understanding of salt priming in plants, but they can also be employed for functional analysis, future functional analysis in olive tree, which is, as Richard mentioned, is uh, still um, a really uh, challenging uh, area in uh, fruit research and fruit trees as an experimental plant. This is a screenshot from our, from our papers published under the focus issue on fruit crops that include the key results that we discussed in the presentation. I would like to acknowledge my supervisor, Afanasios Molasiotis, our collaborators, our funding, and of course, Plant Physiology and American Society of Plant Biologists, Biologists for organizing this seminar and for inviting me to share my work. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Christina. Thank you for the very wonderful talk and the wonderful work. But I'm sorry that we do not have enough time for the questions. We have to move to the next speaker. If you have any questions, please write to Christina directly. So now the second speaker is Jun Su. Dr. Jun Su is from China. He earned his PhD in fruit crop biology in 2022 in the Northwest Agriculture and Forestry University. Now he moved to uh, Yunnan Agriculture University to take the position of a lecturer. His research focuses on the molecular mechanisms underlying plant fractals, metabolism, and its signaling pathways. The aim of his studies is to provide useful data for the future improvement of apple flavor. Welcome, Jim. Thanks. Uh, we are proud to be invited to the plant physiology webinar. <clears throat> okay, let's get started. My title is Constructing Binding Protein, Promoted Degradation uh, of Fractal Techniques to Regulate Sugar Homesteads in Nepal. Uh, we know plants have to withstand any hostile environments, such as very abortic and biotic stresses, and that can lead to advice effects or sales. Scientists have, uh, have explored various response mechanisms that allow plants to compress environment stress use the transgenic experiment. However, the insertion of foreign genes into the plant can cause a serious effect, such as inhibiting plant growth to ensure survival. Plants have, so, uh, plant have a self defense system composed of regulatory networks and the same transduction pathways that have evolved to regulate their position. 
Uh, in we know in most plants, screws is produced by photosynthesis in source leaves and then transported to zinc tissues. Why so loaded to zinc tissues, screws is degraded into structures by photosynthesis or nutrient ventins. It is estimated that 15% of the total carbon uh, flux goes through frog to seam plants. However, in apple and many other fruit trees, Sculpture is a major in the product, accounting for 60% to 18% after being transported into zinc tissues. Almost all the sculpture and half of the screws are converted to fractures. It is estimated that 19% of the total carbon flux goes through fractures for metabolism, in which means that the plants must need high fructose activity, uh, and fructose may be the gateway to uh, fructose metabolism and may regulate sugar homesteads in plants. Early work, we demonstrate that fructose technique two was highly expressed in apple zinc, zinc tissue. That's a fructose type two, not only uh, not only had a high affinity for fructose, but also a high enzymatic activity. And that overexpression fructose, fructose to decrease the fructose concentration in the leaves of young plants. So we guessed that have a mechanism regulating fructose to protein levers in different tissues might operate through post transcription regulation. Uh, so uh, uh, let me introduce my results uh, here. OE4 and OE9 is uh, overexpression of fractal techniques two uh, lies. Uh, early work have have shown that this OE lies had evaluated fractal techniques activity that caused a decline in fractal concentrations in the leaves of young plants. Uh, however, in our paper, in, in these two OE lies, young fruits and mature fruits accumulated high levels of fractals as compared to fruit or the water trees. Similar results were also obtained in mature leaves. It is possible that in shoot tips, young leaves, roots, these teachers, there is a weak sense system to change fructose levers. We believe that the difference might be important in apple for two reasons. First, from an evaluation perspective, the accumulation of fructose in apple fruits could ensure the sweatings of mature fruits helps to attract animals and humans for said dispersal because fructose is the sweetest sober sugar found in flesh fruits. Uh, second, second, although the fructose 2 mRNA levers were significantly higher in different tissues, including mature leaves, young fruits and mature fruits, uh, but there were no significant difference in the activity of fractals in these three tissues between the uh, overexpression fractal techniques two lies and the white top. Uh, strictly, Western blots in line with the data of the fractal techniques activity show that fractal techniques two protein abundance was not substantially different between uh, overexpression lies and the white, white top plants. So we guess have a mechanism that regulates fractal techniques too. Protein levers or activity in different tissues in apple that occurs after transcription, possibly through post-transcriptional modifications. Uh, we know post uh, uh, post transcription uh, uh, regulation plays an important role in maintaining protein homesteads in plata, include the ubi ubiquitation and methylation. Uh, so we guess that they might be a factor intact with fractal techniques too, contribute to the above regulation ubiquitation. Therefore, we script for proteins that interact with fractal techniques to use IPMS method. Um, According to uh, 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 from IPMS results indicated that we identified 23 catalytic proteins related to the ubiquitation pathway. According to the coverage, PETIs, UPETIs, and uh, uh, RNSEC 
results. Finally, we found a protein uh, E3 UVs <coughs> that the amino acid sequence shows similarities to Arabidopsis carcycline binding protein and tomato carcycline binding to, uh, to, uh, protein, which contains the uh, uh, side interacting protein and carcycline uh, binding protein domains, and were therefore renamed the upper carcycline binding protein. The subcellular localization results indicated that calcycline binding protein apple was located in both as a cultoplasm and the nucleus. So we uh, it is plot uh, uh, that a uh, regulatory mechanism that controlled FRAC2 techniques to protein levers was most likely through the ubiquitin pathway and would involve a uh, calcycline binding protein carrying uh, several lines. Evidence supports the idea. First, we use the yes 200 system and QRP system uh, suggested that calcycline binding protein directly interact with fractures into both level and go to. Uh, second, uh, we know calcycline binding protein home nodes for B3 ubiquitin leaks with the side interacting protein, which then targets protein for uh, ubiquitin. We used the in vivo ubiquitin assay. The observed increase in the ammunition of fractures uh, techniques to ubiquitin forms in tobacco when transcend cooperates with the uh, calcycline uh, binding protein. The result indicated that fracture techniques to ubiquitin was mediated by calcycline binding protein. Uh, third, because proteins are um, modified by ubiquitin into the 26 promotism for degradation, so we reasonable to suspect that the FRAC2 techniques to degradation by calcycline binding, uh, counting binding protein is depend on the 26 proteasome pathway. So we uh, here we use the cell-free degradation assay. We found the rapid degradation of the virtual uh, calcular binding protein media, degradation of the FRAC2 technique to uh, radio to what are FRAC2 techniques to in the cell free degradation of them is uh, consistent with this view. Uh, with uh, pretty some inhibitor treatment for the use to validate it. This finding proved that calcycline binding protein interact with and ubiquitin FRAC2 techniques too, leading to its uh, degradation at the protein levels via the 20 expertism pathway. In line with the increased FRAC2 techniques to protein abundance, the FRAC2 techniques activity was significantly increased in overexpression FRAC2 techniques to lies after treatment. By contrast, the relative uh, fractures concentration was significantly lower. Consider this, uh, consider this, there is a possibility that post transcriptional regulation of fracture techniques too for the maintenance of fractures home states by regulating. To further acknowledge the role of uh, 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 binding protein in fractures regulation, a Vegas method was used to determine, as expected, uh, calcycline binding protein silence increased the fractures activity and decreased the fractures concentration. In our results, this measurement indicated that calcycline binding protein uh, uh, and the fractures techniques to possibly, po possibly participate in modu modulating fractures concentration. To gain further evidence for the calcycline binding protein and the FRAC2 techniques to regulatory model of fractures, a similar silence experiment was conducted in apple fruits. Uh, similar to the resulting leaves, uh, we found uh, we, uh, we can see that silence of the calcycline binding protein increased the FRAC2 techniques to protein abundance and resulting in FRAC2 techniques. At, at and the activity increased and uh, decreased the uh, fractures uh, concentration. This, 
these results indicated that um, uh, <coughs> indicated that calcium binding protein promotes the degradation of frac to technique two through a pretty some pathway, which increases the frac to technique element activity to elevate frac to uh, concentration in upper trees. So we uh, finally craft a model for uh, calcium binding protein interacted with CRAC2 techniques too and directly targeted this protein for degradation by the ubiquitin protein pathway, reducing the frac enemy activity to elevate frac concentration and function as a break mechanism for the regulation of frac homesteads in different angles of app. Finally, we pro thanks for prefer my supervisor, prefer uh, Li Mingjun, uh, uh, Professor Ran Yunlin, Professor Ma Baijuan, and uh, uh, my <coughs> student, Dr. Zhu uh, Lin Chen. Thanks. Thank you, Jin, for the very nice presentation. Hello, everyone. Uh, if you have any questions, please type the, your questions in the Q&A box. You still have some time for the questions. Uh, may I have a question first when they are typing the questions, Jim? Uh, so, so when you are when you did the IPMS, you noticed that uh, there were uh, 602 candidate proteins and uh, among them, 23 were related to your bequeeting. So do you have any other kind of uh, uh, modification to the proteins in these candidate proteins? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, according to my according to my experiments, we finally uh, choose the choose the caddis protein. Another caddy protein is not uh, uh, is not uh, uh, is is not an uh, experiment uh, in in plant. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Maybe we should go on. Oh, yes, there, there is one more question from the Great. audience. Great. Uh, it is from Jilla Kali. Uh, the question is, Jim, do you think that hexokinase has a similar regulation? Did you test it? Uh, no, I don't, I don't test it. another test experiment. Okay. Now we have to move to the next one. Our next speaker is Eric Dinko. Eric is a postdoc from Italy. She works on grapevine. In at the University of Verona, she likes grape wine and studied this plant for her PhD in biotechnology. Her aim is to improve the grape wine quality for us. Currently, her research is mainly focused on functional characterization of regulatory genes involved in fruit development and ripening of grape wine. Uh, let's welcome Eric to the presentation. Eric, it's your time now. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure for me to participate in this webinar, uh, presenting my work titled The Transcription Factor NAC60 Regulates uh, Senescence and Ripening Related Processes in Grapevine. Okay. 
uh, plant lifespans are marked by order and indexed to different developmental phases, and the correct timing of the transitions is important for plant tissues and agronomic performance. Phase transitions are governed by complex signaling networks, and this ensures dynamic and fine-tuning adjustment of the plant developmental program. At the end of aging, plant tissues undergo senescence, a finally regulated deteriorating process that involves order physiological, biochemical, metabolic changes, crucial for the cycle of material and energy. And ripening is an active presenescence biological process during which fruit undergo uh, um, dramatic changes uh, to become attractive for animals and the ripening ends with the tissue senescence. Senescence and ripening are both accomplished, uh, accomplished by chlorophyll uh, degradation, secondary metabolite accumulation, cell work break, breakdown, and involve at least some common signaling and regulatory, regulatory factors. Um, at the molecular level, it has been shown that members of NAC transcription factor family play a key role in the regulation of leaf senescence and fruit ripening by interacting with other trans transcription factors, hormones, and environmental signal. And uh, um, tomato nor was the first NAC transcription factor described as a master regulator of fruit ripening. And uh, uh, we know that uh, NAC genes uh, act as both uh, um, transcriptional activators and repressors, and this duality may be achieved by recruiting or interacting with different uh, transcriptional uh, partners. Uh, recently, it has been found that in peach, two NAC transcription factors um, work in a heterodimeric complex for the activation of AMIB genes, um, that is a, a regulator of anthocyan anthocyanin levels in fruits. And uh, uh, moreover, NAC genes uh, are also involved in ripening of not climateric uh, uh, fruits, such as uh, strawberry and citrus. Uh, now let's focus on grapevine, that is uh, one of the most widely cultivated perennial not climateric uh, uh, fruit crops in the world. And the quality of grapes is uh, extremely sensitive to environmental changes, uh, environmental sorry, factors and, war, um, and the global warming is negatively affecting the maturation process. So uh, clearly understanding of the molecular mechanism controlling plant organ development is essential in uh, developing strategies uh, for optimize the grape uh, uh, ripening process in the context of uh, uh, climate changes and additional abiotic stresses. A uh, clear transcriptional distinction between vegetative and mature uh, uh, tissues uh, has been shown, and uh, co-expression network analysis uh, uh, lead to the identification of a set of genes called, uh, called sweet genes as putative regulators uh, of the uh, transition to mature growth in grapevine. And recently, uh, we show that uh, NAC 33 is part of a regulatory network uh, governing the vegetative to mature uh, phase transition. And in this work, uh, we functionally characterize the uh, genes called uh, VV NAC 60. These genes uh, was previously found as putative mass regulators, and its expression increases from the vegetative to senescence uh, phase in all organs, especially in all berries, tissues, and leaves examined. Analysis of NAC60 expression um, during berry development uh, revealed that uh, uh, its induction starts before the expression of several well-known ripening associated genes, and uh, the protein begins to accumulate around 42 days before the onset of ripening and increase during berry ripening in full association with the gene expression profile previously uh, observed. Then uh, um, the NACA um, capability to interact with itself uh, has been demonstrated by performing a BIFS analysis, a bimolecular fluorescent uh, complementation analysis, uh, which also highlighted the uh, NAC60 homodimer uh, locali localization into, into the nucleus. So we can say that NAC60 represent a regulator of vegetative to mature phase transition in grapevine organs. 
Then to explore the role of NAC60, we constructed a full uh, NAC family uh, phylogenetic tree using the uh, 74 grapevine and the 93 uh, tomato sequences, added uh, different NAC protein that have been functional uh, characterized in Arabidopsis and other plant species. Here I report just a part of the tree. As you can see, uh, NAC60 belongs to the NAC clade that includes genes involved in the regulation of uh, senescence, um, um, such as the NAP2 of tomato, the regulate uh, nor expression. And we noted that the, the closest NAC60 homolog uh, resulted to be a NAC47 uh, of Arabidopsis induced upon senescence in uh, leaf petioles. Uh, moreover, interestingly, the NAP clade is close to the NOR clade that includes genes involved in the regulation of fruit ripening. Uh, we generated transgenic grape by plant, uh, plants overexpressing uh, NAC60. NAC Here you can see the phenotype of two uh, month plants. We noted the um, that the overexpression of uh, NAC60 lead to a slightly stunted plant growth due to a significant reduction in internal length, uh, leaf, uh, leaf plant accumulation uh, in young leaves. Uh, then we uh, also uh, generate a dominant uh, repression version of NAC60 by fusing the um, ER repression motif to the C terminus of the protein under the control of the endogenous promoter. And the plant displayed uh, normal growth and with a increases in internal length, leaf area, but a similar anthocyanin content in uh, area. Uh, here uh, you can observe the phenotype of uh, old plants overexpressing NAC60 uh, NAC and plant with the chimeric repressor ER. The plant show opposite phenotypes in terms of, uh, of uh, senescent symptoms compared to the control. Indeed, overexpression of NAC60 lead to a premature leaf senescence, while the um, the, uh, the chimeric repressor uh, the, um, lead to a delay of senescence. Um, we further uh, investigate the influence of uh, NAC60 on uh, cell, uh, cell death in Nicotiana bentamiana leaves agroinfiltrated with uh, the transcription factor under the control of the 35 atom motor. And in this picture, um, you can assert that leaves expressing um, NAC60 uh, display um, browning necrotic regions. And in line with microscopic uh, uh, observation, uh, tripan blue staining and ion uh, leakage measurement clearly confirm a significant increase uh, of cell death when NAC60 is ectopically ex expressed. Moreover, uh, besides cell death induction, aniline blue staining revealed um, a clear color deposition in uh, NAC60 agroinfected leaves. Uh, similarly, in, similarly, in grapevine, uh, both the uh, staining uh, highlighted cell death and colors deposition in areas showing clear resonation symptoms in uh, overexpression leaves and milder responses in leaves uh, of the plant uh, with the chimeric repression ER. So we can say that uh, the plant overexpressing um, NAC60 accelerate the senescent program with increased cell death. Then we carry out a um, dap uh, to inspect the uh, binding landscape um, of uh, NAC60 uh, for later identify its direct uh, targets. Uh, we identify more than to, uh, 70, uh, 27, sorry, thousand uh, binding domain, uh, binding events assigned to more than 11,000 uh, genes. And the distribution of peaks reveal that more than uh, 27 percentage were located within the promoter regions. Then we, um, to identify the high confident uh, target uh, of NAC60, we compare bound genes with the uh, transcriptomic death set uh, from uh, grapevine plants stabling and transiently overexpressing uh, NAC60. And the overlap of the uh, DAPSIC data and at least one of the uh, differentially expressed genes lists uh, show um, 
1,852 high confidence target genes. Uh, those which are mainly rich in response to hormone, abiotic stimuli, wandering, and red light. Then we uh, narrow down our target G, uh, gene set to uh, 89 very high confident target genes by using more stringent criteria. And the expression of uh, these genes were profiled by exploring the Corvina data, um, Corvina Atlas data set, uh, revealing that uh, most of them follows an activation pattern uh, throughout organ development. In particular, several genes were uh, in that, um, in, in that in, in uh, ripening berry at higher expression levels uh, compared to the other organs. And uh, among the, this list, we uh, found many genes involved in the plant uh, development, uh, chlorophyll degradation, such as uh, stagrin one, uh, hormone signaling, secondary metabolism, and uh, responses to biotic uh, stress. We, we focus on attention of, attention of some of them, uh, stay green, MIB1, and MIB14. So uh, stay green one is involved in the chlorophyll degradation uh, during leaf senescence and fruit ripening. MIB1 in, is an anthocyanin regulator, and MIB14. The NAC60 binding landscape of uh, these three promoters analyzed separately, uh, separately uh, confirmed the binding signal of NAC60. And the uh, dual Luciferase report assay showed that uh, NAC60 significantly activated the, uh, this, the, the, the promoter of the, these uh, three genes. Uh, so we can say that NAC60 directly controlled the expression of uh, genes related to senescence and berry ripening. Um, then regarding fruits, um, at, at present, neither the uh, next 60 transgenic plants nor the control flower under greenhouse condition, either in our ability to uh, determine the effect of uh, overexpression and repressor, chimeric repression of uh, NAC60 in uh, transgenic berries. So in this context, the use of tomato heterologous system represented an um, obvious choice uh, for achieving a partial functional characterization of the role of NAC60 in the fruits. So the genes were overexpressed in the North tomato muta background and the plant overexpressing uh, NAC60 um, uh, show a stunted growth in comparison to North plant. And the fruit overexpressing NAC60 uh, were um, smaller in comparison to the other same age fruits, the pericarp resulting redder, and the fruits um, displayed early ripening. Moreover, uh, pigment uh, um, content analysis revealed a significant decrease in, in chlorophyll and in a significant as well as a, um, in a significant increase in uh, um, lycopene, one of the most uh, the most uh, abundant carotenoid in ripe. Tomato. Then we uh, measure, uh, measure ethylene production during the fruit development, and we noted a higher ethylene uh, production in uh, fruit overexpression NAC uh, 60 in comparison to same age no fruits. And moreover, uh, also fruit softening were uh, significantly, um, significantly increased uh, in comparison to uh, same age no fruits. Then uh, NAC 60 activated key genes involved in uh, tomato fruit uh, ripening, uh, despite their uh, expression level did not reach the same level of uh, uh, as the uh, wild type. Uh, we um, performed a QPCR analysis on this uh, uh, of a CC uh, synthase, a polygortulonase, a fitoin synthase, and a still uh, stay green uh, protein one. And uh, the, this analysis showed that all these genes were um, significantly upregulated in uh, the fruits overexpressed in uh, NAC60 in comparison to NOR. So, um, we can say that NAC60 is able to complement the normal mutation in tomato. Concluding, uh, our data show that uh, NAC60 controls different processes activated during maturation, ripening, and senescence, supporting uh, it as a master regulator of the organ phase transition in grapevine. And besides a certain role in senescence, there are uh, there's some several lines of evidence that support the possible role of this uh, transcription factor also in ripening. 
Um, we can conclude that in the global climate change context, uncovering the molecular mechanism of the ripening could offer the, the key maintaining high quality grapes and wine. And in the next future, we could think to change the duration of vegetative growth phase by modifying the timing of the onset of ripening. And this will uh, help us to reverse the current uh, trend towards uh, the um, earlier ripening that leads to poor quality grape uh, um, products. So we can conclude saying that NAC60 could be a target for modification toward climate resilience and fruit ripening. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge all my colleagues uh, at University of Verona, um, the um, group of Professor Matus in Valencia, Professor Bottoni Padua, and the Giovannoni Lab at Cornell University and uh, in uh, New York. And thank you. Eric. Thank you for your very wonderful presentation. A lot of questions are waiting for you. Mm -hmm. I will read some of them for you. Well, someone is very interested in the senescence and a lot of questions have been written. So when do grape wines typically, typically reach senescence? What can be done with grape vines that have reached senescence? Can senescence be prevented or delayed in grape vines? How can I identify senescence in grape vines? What causes senescence in grape vines? <laughs> so you can choose some of them to answer. Thank uh, you. Okay. Okay, so um, most of the uh, question is about the senescent grapevine, I think. Yes. Right? Yes. So how I can identify? So um, uh, as I show you in the presentation, um, uh, for sure we we. Um, uh, we can uh, recognize the senescent symptoms uh, when the plant, when the, the leaves uh, start become uh, losing chlorophyll and started to be the, the to have the uh, clear senescent symptoms like uh, um, the the leaves uh, become to be uh, yellowish and also uh, the the cell death. I think it's a um, uh, a clear uh, symptoms correlated to the uh, senescence. Uh, indeed, uh, maybe in this presentation, I don't have, uh, I didn't don't have time to um, show you all the results that we have obtained. So maybe that's why it's not so clear. But uh, um, if you have time to maybe read the, the paper, uh, you can see among the, the target genes of uh, NAC60, uh, we found many genes involved in, uh, in uh, ABBA pathway that is involved in um, is mediating the, regula the um, regulation of senescence. And then uh, there is uh, maybe there is this a, a cross token uh, between the um, signaling pathway of leaf senescence and, uh, for example, the, the pathogen induced uh, the defense in, uh, in, re in um, defense responses. Uh, so I don't know, maybe I don't answer, I don't know if I answer of some of the question, but. Um, um, Thank okay. you, Eric. Yeah. So, well, uh, so the other another question is about are plant growth regulators commonly used in grape industry to control senescence and flowering time? If so, have you explored how NAC60 expression changes with different treatments? Mm. Explore. Uh, actually, not yet. Uh, Mm, we we just mm, in this work we we mm, did not try to mm, apply different treatments. Uh, we just. Uh, um, try to um, 
uh, we just analyze some uh, data set, uh, different data set, but just uh, not uh, in vivo, uh, not doing in, in vivo treatment. And we see that, uh, for example, the temperature seem to affect uh, NAC60, but uh, not really consistent. So for sure, we need uh, to do a, a correct experimental design to demonstrate uh, the expression of NAC60 chains. Erica mentioned there was a storm where she is. I think her internet may be a bit unstable, um, but perhaps it's time to wrap up. Richard, would you like to uh, to say a few words at the end? Well, thank you very much. Thank you for to Chang for such a good job in moderating. And uh, thank you to our three speakers, Christina, Jing, and Erica. Um, Erica, I hope you can hear me. <laughs> uh, you guys are still there. Uh, really good talks, a nice range of talks. So thank you so much. Uh, Mary's already advertised the next one on the 27th of July. So please come along to that. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Great talks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.